Thank you. I am Chris Miller from WashU. Um, I'm going to be talking to you today about uh, tumor heterogeneity, clonal evolution, and how we're using sequencing to get some insight into both of these phenomena. So my first statement here will be that tumors are heterogeneous. Um, this was suspected as far back as the 70s, um, but it's really taken the advent of high throughput sequencing before we were able to dive deep into these tumors and, and see that they are, in fact, genetically diverse populations of cells. And that because of that, within these, evolution is occurring at the cellular level. Um, and then last year, we were able to uh, you know, view this in action in a case of relapsed AML, where we sequenced both an AML tumor, uh, match normal, and a relapse. Um, and using that, we were able to put together a model of uh, exactly how this clonal evolution works, at least in this case. Um, it starts off with the hemopoietic stem cell, which gains initiating mutations here. And then as the tumor expands, some of these cells acquire additional mutations, represented here in uh, purple, yellow, and orange. And then these mutations may expand, and so when we assay the tumor at diagnosis, what we're getting is really a cross-section of this clonal architecture of the tumor, where some of the cells look a lot like the founding clone, some of them are this, this subclone that occurs in you know, about 50 percent of the cells, and then others are smaller fractions of the tumor. Um, as chemotherapy then is induced and treatment is, goes on, uh, it creates a population bottleneck where this population of cells is, is reduced and only a few pass through, and then this expands back into a relapse then and acquires additional mutations after the treatment uh, ceases. And so uh, what's really interesting in this particular case is that the clonal fraction that uh, actually went on to form the relapse only appeared in about 5 percent of the cells in the original tumor, which is a little frightening to be perfectly honest and it makes us wonder you know, whether we could have missed it if we hadn't looked more carefully. And so detecting these minor subclones is, we think, crucially important to understanding, you know, how these tumors are uh, responding to therapy and, and to make sure that we get the whole tumor and not just the major subclone. I think there are several challenges uh, that remain in detecting these. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, first of all, the genomes are sequenced with low coverage. I mean, 30x whole genome sequencing is clearly not enough to detect events that are present only at 1 or 2 percent in the tumor, and even 100 or 150x, you know, exome sequencing may not be deep enough. Um, but that at least seems like a tractable problem. The sequencing costs are dropping rapidly. Uh, perhaps a more pervasive problem that we're interested in is that algorithms aren't designed to detect these low-frequency events by and large. Um, if you look at this uh, power simulation from our somatic sniper algorithm, which is one of the kind of first generation of variant callers, you'll see that even with 90x coverage, our power to detect events at 20 percent variant allele frequency is only 85 percent, and if we drop down to 10 percent variant allele frequency, it's only 10 percent. So we're clearly missing a lot of these low frequency things. And so that spurred us to develop an algorithm called BASIVAC, um, Bayesian scoring of somatic variant read counts. It's a little convoluted, but uh, it works. Um, and so this incorporates purity, ploidy, base quality, and a host of other factors and into a more complex model. Uh, we pull these all together into a Bayesian framework and uh, then obtain the probabilities that in a particular single nucleotide variant is either heterozygous or homozygous given the input data. And so we've tested this against uh, other algorithms. This is kind of a uh, worst case uh, simulation, but you can see that even in this uh, difficult environment, it's, it's pushing our curve of very low frequency far to the left compared to somatic sniper and these kind of first generation callers. We've also done some real world testing, and I want to tell you about one particularly uh, cool data set that we've been working with. This is a quintet of samples, including a primary breast tumor, a match normal, and three different metastases um, from the spinal, the liver, and the adrenal glands. And so we whole sequ genome sequenced all of these to 30x and ran these through our initial pipeline. This was prior to the development of BASIVAC. Um, and then capture validation was performed for all these variants. So we have very deep sequencing read counts for all of these variants and all of these samples. And so we were able to combine these all and then make cool plots that look like this. So what I'm showing you here on the x-axis is the variant allele frequency of single nucleotide variants in the primary tumor. And on the y-axis, you're seeing the uh, frequency of events in the metastasis. And so several trends emerge from this kind of plot. Uh, you can see that in the, uh, at about 50 percent, you see, which uh, corresponds to 100 percent of the cells in the tumor for heterozygous events, we see uh, the major clone, or the founding clone, which is also present at about 50 percent of the metastasis, as we'd expect. Um, down here we see another cluster of uh, a kind of minor clone that is present at about 25 percent, and that, again, also passed through to the metastasis. And then contrast, down here on the x-axis, what we see is a, uh, is a clone that was present in the original tumor, 
but didn't pass through to the metastasis. So this was a separate population of cells that, that didn't make it through the population bottleneck or didn't make it through the metastasis event. Then on the y-axis, what we see are events that uh, happened in the spinal metastasis, presumably after the split, so they're not present in the original tumor, or at least that's what we thought. When we zoomed in a little bit closer to this y-axis, what we can see is that these events I've highlighted in red actually were present at the tumor, just at a very low frequency. And so that suggests that, that maybe they either had a growth advantage in the environment of the metastasis or just made up a majority of the cells that split off into the metastasis. But either way, uh, they're clearly present. And getting back to our variant calling then, this gives us a source of very low frequency variants in this tumor that we know are real because they're present in the metastasis as well. And so we use these kind of events to test the sensitivity of our algorithms. So this is a comparison between three algorithms, Basavac, our new caller, Sniper, our old caller, and Strelka, which is a caller from Illumina, which uh, purports to do better on these kind of low variant low frequency events. Um, and what you can see is that Basavac and Sniper detect uh, a lot of events and they're very comparable for performance at kind of high variant allele frequencies and mid variant allele frequencies. Uh, Strelka doesn't maybe do as well, but about 10% there's an inflection point where uh, Sniper just isn't able to detect stuff. Strelka does a little bit better, but Basavac detects a huge number of these very low frequency true positive events. Um, and, uh, you know, in the end, even with this kind of uh, biased uh, 30x approach originally, we can see that 50% of the variants present in the metastases are present at the detectable level in the tumor, um, even though we would have expected a much smaller proportion if we hadn't looked closely and looked deeply with the capture validation. Um, but more importantly, what we can say here is that we can use passive act to detect these true variants at very low frequencies, um, down to and, and even lower than 2%. So given this kind of information then about these low frequency variants, how can we put this to use to kind of infer the, the subclonal architecture of a tumor and find out you know, how many clones are present in there, which variants are present in the different subclones? And this really requires an integrative approach where we look at both the very low frequencies of the SNVs as well as information on copy number calls, purity, and ploidy. Um, and so we can put it all together into beautiful charts that look like this. I'm going to zoom in so you can actually see what's going on here. And so we segregate the SNVs according to copy number, and um, then we plot their variant allele frequencies along with the depth just kind of for our reference on the y-axis. And you can see here in the 2x plot, you get a clear uh, indication of the founding clone. Um, and then we overlay it with a kernel density plot on top here. So you can see this, this clear peak at 50%, which tells us this is the major, the founding clone. And then you see these variants down here with a little bit lower frequency correspond to blips up here that represent subclones. And then over on the right side, you can see events that are uh, copy number neutral loss of heterozygosity up here near 100%. And in the copy number three regions, what you can see is that instead of the 50% major clones we expect, we expect peaks at 33 and 66%, depending on whether the wild type or the mutant allele got amplified. And we do see that indeed in the data. And so we can build these plots for um, all of our tumors and uh, you kind of eyeball it and say this clearly looks like it's a two clone tumor, a major clone and a minor clone. Um, but uh, we get very leery of, of kind of eyeballing plots. We like to do it in a more rigorous fashion. Um, so we decided to come up with a method that could do this in an automated and kind of unbiased manner. And so what we ended up doing was creating a, uh, an algorithm that uses a mixture model of binomial distributions to kind of model this data and then use maximum likelihood expectation to uh, uh, determine how, what the optimal number of clusters was for any given solution. Um, and so we can see that indeed this algorithm clusters this into two groups. It says there's a major clone and a minor clone. I've overlaid the, the calls here. Um, and this is a biclonal sample. Here's a case where it's a triclonal sample that, you know, clearly agrees with our eyeballing of the data. And there are cases that are a little more or less intuitive, I guess. Um, this is a case where maybe if you looked at just the density plot, you might say this was a two-clone. Uh, tumor. But if you look carefully, you can see that there's a nice peak here, there's a nice peak here, and then kind of a smear in the middle. And the algorithm does a very nice job of picking that up, fitting another curve in the middle there, and saying this is indeed a three clone tumor. And then we also have, uh, you know, more messy tumors. Uh, this is a multi clonal sample with a smear of data, and uh, we don't think we're doing too much overfitting in this kind of case. We, we think there really are a, a variety of clones here, but it's very difficult to segregate them accurately at this kind of, uh, uh, with this kind of schmear of mutations. So we've applied this across a, a large sample set of tumors, um, looking mostly at AML, breast cancer, and endometrial cancer. And we can say that most of the tumors in those data sets have at least one founding clone and one or more subclones. 
Um, and I also want to emphasize that uh, the numbers I'm showing here, are, these are going to be a lower bound on the number of clones. First of all, uh, detection sensitivity hurts us. Um, because not all these calls were made using PassiveAct. But more importantly, I think, uh, is that we're unable to distinguish with this kind of data between two independent clones that both occur at, say, 20 percent varying allele frequency um, without, you know, kind of single cell method. There's no way to get that, that from this data. Uh, so in conclusion, we can detect some activations at very low frequencies using BASIVAC, our new caller, um, and we developed an R package for uh, automatically inferring the subclonal architecture in tumors. Um, we hope to release beta versions of both of these by the end of the year. Um, they're not currently available, but will be shortly. Um, and really the overarching goal of this kind of research is to characterize these minor subclones at diagnosis rather than discovering their presence at the relapse when it may be already too late to design appropriate treatments. Um, so in conclusion, then, I'd like to acknowledge um, a host of people who made this possible. Mike Wendell has been leading the BASIVAC project, and Nathan Dees uh, has been pushing uh, the clonality analysis out the door. Um, a host of people at the Genome Center over here who have contributed in one way or another. Our collaborators who have provided data and expertise and advice, the leadership at the Genome Center, and then our funding agencies at the NHGRI and the NCI, and of course the Cancer Genome Atlas. Thanks. I wonder if there isn't an important implication in your breast cancer metastasis finding. So if I understand correctly, in the metastasis you got both the tumor dominant clone mm -hmm. with all the 50 percent alleles and you got a tumor subclone. Mm -hmm. So does that predict then the metastasis must not have come from a single cell but rather a clump of cells that had both the minor and the major one in it, or you're recreating all those mutations in the metastasis. Well, so anything, subclone. so any mutation that's present in the founding clone is going to be present in all the subclones as well. Um, but the fact that it does appear at a lower varying little frequency does indeed predict that it's not a single cell that caused that metastasis, that it was a clump of cells containing both those original ones and a, and a subset with additional mutations from the subclone, yeah. I'm not an expert in this area, but I, I know I'm not there's either, a lot but done, <laughs> a lot said about individual breast cancer cells being found in the bone marrow and et cetera, and, and whether clumps might be more the thing that metastasizes. Yeah, I, I don't doubt that this uh, single cells may be capable of that, but in this case it's clearly not one cell. Yes, hi. Uh, I, I have a technical question. Sure. It seems to me that the selection of the bandwidth of your kernel density estimate should affect the number, the estimate of the maximum likelihood estimate of the number of subclonal populations. Have you looked into that, or how do you choose that bandwidth? So we don't actually use the bandwidth when we're uh, doing the, the binomial fitting. Um, the bandwidth is, is clearly smoothing for I, just to okay. get the pretty pictures. Um, so we actually just take the raw data and feed it into the algorithm, so yeah. So here, I got a question. So sure. if you were to compare uh, the clonality analysis coming from exomes versus full genomes, are they, do they give you similar answers, uh, the same answer? That, that's very dependent um, upon the number of variants that we're finding in these tumors. Yeah, For example, even in some of the whole genomes, uh, or in, definitely in some of the AML exomes where you see a very few mutations, it's very hard to cluster with only 10 mutations, right? It's, it's very hard to know what's going on there. Um, the exomes, uh, um, so we do have to set a minimum threshold so on the number probably do of that mutations like the, that we have. The breast cancer data where there's 20 basal genomes, full sequence, then the exomes on those, right? Yeah, when we have whole genomes, it's really easy because you can include all those tier 2 and tier 3 mutations and get hundreds of mutations to get much finer resolution on your kind of subclone architecture. Um, with just tier 1 exome stuff, it's a little bit harder, but um, we can do it, provided that there's enough mutations there's in enough the sample. enough mutations, gotcha. Yeah. All right. Thank you. So uh, our next speaker will be uh, Adam Ewing from uh, UC Santa Cruz.